Chapter 13 Once upon a time, there lived a man by the name of Charles. I refer to him in the past tense because I'm not implying that there is a man by the name of Charles, only that there once was. He existed on this planet for a relatively short time, no more than 20 years or so. He spent every waking moment riding on the edge and kicking dust into the abyss, and every sleeping moment thinking up new ways to do it. His life was a constant drag race with the devil on a highway to hell, right up to the burning finish line where he met his end. The death of our friend Charles came in the form of a big hairy beast from without. The time was late at night. The location was a remote desert highway somewhere in eastern Washington, where rattlesnakes slither and nobody comes to take pictures for postcards. The cause of death was transcendence. When Charles was scratched by that werewolf, the one he'd soon come to know as Grandfather Red Eagle, he may have survived the attack on a physical level, but his identity, his former existence as a rough-and-tumble guy who could fight and fuck within the same half hour without needing a break and nothing more, came to a bloody end. As a phoenix dies to give way for a new creature to rise from its ashes, such was the case from the moment those claws penetrated Charles's skin. In his little cabin deep in the woods of Idaho, Grandfather Red Eagle taught him how to settle into his new identity with the spirit of the demon wolf. With every animal he brought down in those woods, every bowl of high-end tobacco he smoked, and every beer can and liquor bottle he slurped down, the new creature rose up a little bit higher. By the time our hero bade farewell to his OG and set off to return to his home in Washington, Charles existed no longer. The one who returned was the one we know today, Wolfman Charles. Like Charles before him, Wolfman Charles can still knock you out and ruin you for your sweetheart afterwards. But this new creature can do more than that, shredding you into ground beef and doing the same with your sweetheart when he's done with her. Wolfman Charles can walk into any forest in any state within this beautiful country of ours, and all the animals know to back the fuck off, from the birds to the bees to the bears to Sasquatch. As a matter of fact, he'd like to add that Sasquatch ain't shit but a little bitch, at least based on his few personal encounters with the guy. When the birds quit chirping and the cicadas quit buzzing, when the deer run off and the snakes take cover in their little snake holes, look to your left and look to your right, be very quiet, and listen closely. Should any sort of huffing and puffing reach your ears, you'd better have somewhere to run to. Once Charles was back in Washington, it wasn't long before he met a girl. The girl, who won't be named as per Charles's request, was 17 years old when he found her, and before she could turn 18, she was already in the later stages of pregnancy with his child. Charles, unsure of whether the government considered him dead or a living fugitive, was unemployed and homeless with no assets to speak of except for his truck. His baby mother still lived with her family in one of those portable homes that you have to split in half and drag away with a semi-truck. This house became his home, sharing a bed with his baby mother in her childhood bedroom, coexisting with her wiry, chain-smoking mother, her equally wiry and chain-smoking uncle, whose favorite pastime was to preach about conspiracy theories, and her mute, paralyzed grandmother, who rarely left her spot in the living room in front of the television where her wheelchair was parked. Every now and then, one of the household members would be blessed with the privilege of transporting Granny's chamber pot bucket across the house to the bathroom and back. This was generally a time when guests would be advised to stay outside, at least for the next few hours. As you may have guessed, Charles assimilated into this family quite nicely. He helped around the house, offering his wit and charm to the atmosphere, when it wasn't overtaken by Granny's bucket. And most importantly, he made their little girl happy every night when he laid the pipe down. For the first time, he was surrounded by love and acceptance. It seemed as though he'd been given a new beginning by the Great Spirit, a chance to save his soul and become a family man. The only problem was that after Charles moved in with his baby mother's family, they were suddenly plagued with unwanted occurrences, which, for some reason, always took place over three-day periods, one out of each month. The family had three dogs. Their names and breeds don't matter. All you need to know is that they were big, dumb, and dearly loved. Needless to say, they all died in the first month. The first night, one was found gruesomely dead in the front yard. The second night, another went missing, later to be found gruesomely dead by a neighbor down the street. After the second one, Mom called the police. They said they'd look into it. Don't they always? On the third night, the last dog was locked inside and put under close watch. The family was hysterical. Charles was quiet. Before coming home on these particular nights, he made sure to wash off and shave his body in a park restroom. He'd been out running around with some friends, he told his baby mother, going mudding and drinking around a bonfire. No, there weren't any other women there, just the guys. Things would get a little crazy sometimes, you know how it is. He wasn't out all night till the crack of dawn doing anything too mischievous. Calm down, babe. You're just shaken up about the dogs. We all are. The next morning, the last dog was missing, and the front door was wide open. 
Who left it open? It obviously wasn't Granny. It wasn't Mom. She was the one who locked it. It wasn't Uncle. He'd been holed up in his room all night on the computer with a six-pack of beer and a jar of peanut butter. It wasn't the baby mother. She'd gone to bed after a hearty throw-up session. Who could it have been? Charles was in some pretty hot water now. He'd been out with the boys for the evening, he admitted, and he came back at around two when the house was all quiet and crawled into bed. Baby mother couldn't contest this, of course. She'd been asleep since seven, and she did wake up next to Charles. But still, he had to have been the one to leave the door open. Had he been drinking? He had to admit to that. Everyone knew how clumsy he got when he got hold of the whiskey bottle. Nobody was too angry at Charles, least of all Granny, who probably wasn't even aware that any dogs had even gone missing. The only provision now was that Charles had to go out and find him. Baby mother wanted to go with, but the whole family unanimously forbade it, except for Granny, who sometimes and sometimes wasn't even aware that her granddaughter was even pregnant. Uncle decided to come with instead, that way they'd at least have two pairs of eyes on the lookout. Charles agreed to this idea, but suggested that for even greater efficiency, they split up and take separate vehicles. Charles would patrol this end of town, and Uncle would patrol that one. So they went off in opposite directions, Uncle going off on a wild goose chase, and Charles going in the direction he'd picked, the direction from which the smell was coming. Dead dog smell came from many directions, but only one trail had the distinct marking that Charles recognized as their dog. Of course, he already had a vague idea of what happened to the poor little mutt. He knew what had happened to the other two as well. Now that the situation was heating up, it was time for damage control. He wasn't sure yet what to do when he found the body, but the 15 or so minutes of driving it took to get there gave him time to think it over. The stronger the smell became, the more frantic were his thoughts. The question was, would he give up the search, or would he report the dead dog's body and take the blame for letting it happen? When the smell became so overwhelmingly rank that he knew it was time to pull over and look around, Charles had reached a small reserve of sand and thistles further up the main highway from civilization. When the smell became so overwhelmingly rank that he knew it was time to pull over and look around, Charles had reached a small reserve of sand and thistles further up the main road away from civilization. Private property, no trespassing, said the sign. To Charles, such signs translated to, hop this fence, no balls. He sniffed his way into the place, over the snake holes and around the brush, and when the smell finally engulfed him from all directions, he found it. There was the dog, or at least what was left of him. Once he saw what he was looking for, Charles realized what to do. The dogs had run off before and were often found trotting around in places like this. Naturally, it was one of the first places where Charles figured he ought to look. Then, driving up the road, he was suddenly overwhelmed by dead animal smell. He didn't want to assume the worst, but he'd have to check. You know, just to be completely sure. And sure enough, there was the body. It must have been coyotes, or maybe a cougar. Who knows? But either way, it was a truly horrible way to see the poor little thing for the last time. He was such a good boy, too. The first thing he thought to do in such a state of grief was call Uncle, who caught up with him and just so happened to have a couple of shovels in the truck. Burying the dog was the best thing to do. You wouldn't want to see what he looked like, trust me. And the smell. Oh, man. The hot sun really did a number on the decaying process. This was the story that Charles told his baby mother's family. Everyone was so heartbroken by the tragedy that nobody had the energy to be mad at Charles about it. He'd made a stupid mistake, yes, but we all do sometimes. This wouldn't normally happen anyhow. Something must have been up with the coyotes. But please, Charles, you've got to be more careful in the future. Oh yes, they were right. Charles would most definitely be more careful in the future. Chapter 14 The Jack really hit the spot, almost as hard as the story that Charles had just told me. The part about him having an estranged baby mother didn't really surprise me, but the part about actually wanting to be reunited with her and being on a big fat quest to make it happen was truly some heartwarming shit. I all but shouted for him to tell me what happened next. If I had a bucket of popcorn, I definitely would have spilled it. How did they get separated? Or did he plan to get her back? The smugness on his face made it obvious, though. Part two would be for another time. So, why do you need to go see that Red Eagle guy? I asked. Well, said Charles, gazing at the remaining liquid in the bottle as he swashed it around. What happened with me and her... Something tells me it's pretty common with guys like me. Werewolves? Well, that too. But Grandfather Red Eagle, he knows quite a bit. He's got resources and contingency plans, shit like that. Contingency plans? 
Yeah, he's been around, you know, and he's in with the Demon Wolf tribe and everything. They have these meetings every once in a while. They're like a support session type of thing, and they get together and talk about the problems going on in their lives. Werewolf problems, mostly. I held out my hand for the bottle, and he passed it over. Werewolf problems, I said, taking a swig. Like what, shaving? Charles laughed. Well, yes, actually, he said, and also had to wash blood out of the carpet. But they talk about important shit, too. Shit like, say, I knocked up an underage girl and her family exiled me for some special secret reason? I drank a little more. The volume and frequency of each sip of liquor I tended to take had increased dramatically since meeting this man. When I was still in Salt Lake, a heroin-shooting bum was telling me about his own alcoholism, how he used to go through a gallon of this and that hard liquor every day. I chuckled and told him I could hardly finish a 40, to which he responded, that's how it starts. In the split second of noticing how much more I could stomach now, that bum's words rang through my head. He also happened to be one of those two cunning dope fiends I mentioned earlier, the ones who stole my backpack. Looking back, that may or may not add extra weight to what he said. Yeah, said Charles. Things in that vein. Speaking of shaving, by the way, I'm about to go get my buzzer from the truck. I said, good idea. I don't think this place allows pets. So Charles left and came back with his buzzer along with a pair of garden shears and a bottle of shaving cream bigger than anything I'd ever seen at the store. He gave me a little salute, I saluted him back, and he disappeared into the bathroom, leaving me alone with the jack bottle, still about a quarter full. My eyes were a little bigger than my stomach. Once again, after two or three or four or more swigs, I began to enter the danger zone. Once the room started moving around too much for comfort, I knew it was cigarette time. What a lovely night. The place was quiet once again, and the air was crisp. There were more stars out than when I'd been out last. Or were there? I might have been so caught up in all the bullshit before that I never noticed. It's almost like the Great Spirit puts in all those extra little details as a reward for those who remember not to worry. I thought about this while I blew my smoke. I thought about all that sales motivation stuff I'd been trying to live by. The goals, the affirmations, the positive thought, and everything else in that package are all fine and dandy, virtuous even, but I think the real secret that Ziegler and Hill and Carnegie wanted us all to understand was something deeper than getting rich and accomplishing things. Rich is a word with a more fluid definition than a lot of us realize. There's nothing wrong with working for material prosperity, of course, but there's also wealth in realizing how lucky you are to be alive. The man who gets all that, I realized is the man who gets the most out of all those pretty things you see in places where they haven't poured any concrete yet. I flicked my cigarette butt to the blacktop and retreated back inside. When I saw the jack bottle on the bedside table, I suddenly remembered why I'd stepped outside in the first place and noticed I wasn't so dizzy anymore. The buzzer buzzed in the bathroom. You good in there? I called to Charles. Never better, he said, poking his head out the door. It was weird to see him looking like a normal person again. At least his dog teeth were still there to remind me that he wasn't. He promptly disappeared back into the bathroom, and the buzzing began again. I sat down and wrote. The manuscript was starting to pick up, about thirty-some pages now. Time passed. I got about two pages in, and then stopped to stretch. That always feels good. My mind wandered to that job I was supposed to get to. Lots of people were probably wondering what was happening to me, and why I wasn't texting them back. There wasn't much I could do about it. Hey Nick, come check this out! Charles hollered from the bathroom. Jesus, H. Christ, what is it? I forced myself up and staggered over to the bathroom. Once I got there, I saw what he was talking about. Charles was now disguised in his usual pants and shirt, disguised as a human, sitting on the edge of the bathtub, grinning his classic grin and gloating over the great work of art he'd just made on the floor. Basically, there was a carpet now. The entire floor was covered with huge tufts of wolfman hair. Well, I said, that's adorable. Of course it is, said Charles. I knew you wouldn't want to miss it. That's why I'm making sure you get a good long look at it before I sweep it all up. I turned to leave. You have fun with that, I called from behind. And yes, I'll put it in the book. I don't think he really cared whether I put it in the book or not. I'm pretty sure he was happy with my reaction alone. Either way, I put it in. So there you go, you goddamn filthy animal. The rest of the night was fairly pleasant. I drank a little more, wrote a little more, and when Charles came out of the bathroom, he informed me that there was no broom, so he had to pick up all his wolfman hair tufts by hand. In addition, he also informed me that the little bathroom garbage can was now filled to the brim with his hair, so there was no point in trying to toss anything in there. Not that it was our problem anyways, he added, since we were about to check out the next morning. So where to next, Captain? I asked. 
the cabin, said Charles, and you're going to meet the big man. At long last? I passed the bottle back. At long last. And when we get there, he should be able to help you out with your situation. Really? How so? Because, said Charles, it's the tribe, man. We've survived in the world for this long, right? Fair enough. I asked no further questions. No point in trying to get a straight answer out of Charles. We ended the night merry and drunk, but not too drunk to lay down. We didn't stay up horribly late. In the morning, we'd have to get up and go before the cleaning lady saw the wolf hair in the garbage can and start asking questions. The trip would be another hour and a half or so to the northeast. Charles figured we'd have just enough cash left for the gas. The last thing we did before we turned in was grab all the beer cans on the floor and fill up the loose grocery bags. We left them all lined up against the wall by the corner in a row of seven, the bags bulging even with the cans all crushed. Chapter 15 They say life is a beautiful thing. I would agree. Few are blessed with it. As long as you have it, there's always something new to learn about it. It swings this way and it jumps that way, and just when you think you've found the formula, it always finds a new way to show you what a fool you were to think you could ever figure it out. They say a woman is a beautiful thing too. I would agree with that also. Oftentimes the same things apply that are commonly attributed to life. Like a woman, life swings this way and that, and always has something unexpected up its sleeve, and is for all intents and purposes unpredictable. Also like a woman, life possesses beauty so breathtaking that one is always distracted, never quite ready for the moment it decides to become angry and do something horrible to your car. Aw, shit. We were about 20 minutes into the drive when Charles started to slow down. What's wrong? My first instinct was to swivel my head around to look for cops. No cops, though. Just trees and highway here. Fucking hell, man. Does this really have to happen right now? Charles pulled over and smacked the dashboard with a breathy sigh. What's wrong? I asked again. My heart began to pitter-patter, and I tried to breathe deeply to slow it down. The temperature gauge, Charles muttered. The fucking thing's overheating on me. Oh, shit, that's what happened with my Subaru back in Salt Lake. Charles gave me a puzzled look. That's it? Um, well... I stumbled for words, trying to remember exactly what the mechanic said to me. It was that, and they also told me I'd blown a head gasket. I trailed off, hoping Charles would know what I was talking about, because I sure as hell didn't. Oh, ho, 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 fuck, he said, knowing what I was talking about. How much did they try to bill you for that? Fifteen hundred bucks. Charles whistled a whistle that clearly said, yikes. He told me the grandfather Red Eagle might be able to help me get something different, and then I could just leave the Subaru to rot. Did I have anything in the car that I cared about? I thought about it. Old yearbooks with signatures and heartfelt notes from old friends, business casual clothes I'd bought secondhand for my sales job, bags of the few books that I didn't give away before I left Washington, a local hipster magazine containing my first published short story, and somewhere in there I know I had an old zip-up binder containing a couple of love notes from my ex-girlfriend from high school complete with X's and O's and tiny little hearts all over the pages. Fuck it, I said. Sounds good to me. So it was decided, but first, we'd have to get out and walk back to the little convenience store we'd passed about five minutes ago. Ideally, you'd want to get a bottle of coolant for this type of thing, but those were 40 or 50 bucks, and we didn't have that much to spare, so a jug of water would have to do until we got to the cabin. It wasn't too cold, being about 12 or so in the afternoon, just a little chilly, but by the time we got back, it would surely be Antarctica, so we bundled up anyways. Cigarette time, said Charles. It's always cigarette time. I chirped back, and we lit up before we started the trek. The walk was long and mostly uphill, but the Idaho scenery sure was nice. I hadn't gotten to experience the wild and free part of the state like this since my scout days. I'd stopped in Boise for a night on my way to Salt Lake, but we all know that isn't really Idaho. Every biome in the world is beautiful in its own way, of course, but nothing quite beats the green forests of the Pacific Northwest. So your friend, I said, finishing my cigarette up. You said he could help me get a new car, but how much is he going to want for it? Because I have about this much money. I held up a zero to show Charles exactly how much money I had. I'm sure he'll work something out for you. He didn't ask me for shit, and I drank his beer for three months. To that I said, okay, and asked nothing further. This was all very comforting to hear, but still that little voice of doubt continued to prick me in the side. I trusted the plan and went with it, but at the same time reminded myself that man plans and God laughs, or rather, the great spirit laughs. In an effort to calm the stormy seas, I tried to focus my mind on more positive things. One way or another, I knew I'd get to Colorado at some point. Sales is the highest paid profession out there, Ziegler had told me. 
I couldn't wait to get on that program. Then, I thought of the program I really wanted to be on, my writing. I'd never written a full-length book before, so the idea of doing Charles' biography seemed like a good way to start off. Not only was there plenty to work with, but I also didn't have to bother with developing any story of my own. Everything was already cut out for me, unfolding right in front of my eyes. No bad ideas, no writer's block. Then, in the midst of all my cheerful contemplation, a question popped up. Hey, Charles, I said, not looking up from my shoes. What's up? When you first picked me up off the street, did you intend to take me with you this far? Yeah, man, when you said you were a writer. Yeah, I said, still looking at my shoes. But my question is, why do you trust me exactly? Like, you've never read anything I've written before, so how do you know I'll even do a good job? Why did you even believe that I was really a writer in the first place? Well, I'll put it to you like this, man, said Charles. With the whole spirit of the wolf thing I have, there's a lot more to my senses than smell. I can tell things about a guy when I first meet him. I looked up to make eye contact. What could you tell? Charles cracked a smile as he puffed on his dwindling cigarette. A warm smile, not the usual dog one. Well, for one thing, I could tell you were a little fucking weird, he said. And you were talking a little too fancy just to be a lying street bum. That and it seems like you've got some heart. Enough to tell my story and do it some justice, at least. I looked back down at my shoes and said, Oh, so it's pretty important to you then? Telling your story right? Absolutely, man, said Charles. I want my kid to grow up and hear it in case I'm not there to tell it myself. Do you know if it's a boy or a girl yet? No, I'm not really worried about it, though. More about whether it'll grow up to be like me. I looked back up at him. A werewolf? Now Charles was looking down at his shoes. Yeah, that, he said. And other things, too. Other things like what? I don't know, said Charles. Like being a fugitive or... Being homeless or having killed another person or smoking goddamn cigarettes? I feel it, man, I said. I still can't believe I'm smoking cigarettes. It's like you start with one or two and pretty soon it's the only thing you think about. Yeah, man. I mean, besides pussy. But I do want to quit eventually. The same here, but not right now. Too much stressful bullshit going on. We were silent for the rest of the walk. The scenery changed very little until we reached the store. We got that jug of water and started back, lighting another cigarette. We stayed pretty quiet. It was starting to get a little dimmer out, and the air was turning a little more crisp. It would have been the most peaceful walk of all time if the suits weren't snooping around in the truck when we got back to it. We stopped. They were still about 200 feet downhill. We backed up slowly, not having been noticed yet. I whispered to Charles, Bro, we cannot let them get the manuscript. Charles whispered back, They won't. He tugged on my arm and led me over the little roadside fence and into the woods. We crept through the shadows, Charles in front. I copied his movements, crouched down and speeding along with feet as light as I could make them. This must be how the wolves do it. It was actually pretty fun. It almost took away some of the stress of trying to sneak up on government agents. That is, if the government was who the suits were actually with. What branch does one need to join to get icicle static powers? Right here, Charles whispered, motioning for me to stop. There was a slope from the ground we stood on to the fence up above. Charles looked back at me. You got that knife? I stared at him blankly for a second before I reacted. I gave him the knife and he held his finger to his lips. I nodded. There I stood, pulse racing, developing an ulcer, watching Charles crawl up the slope. It was about three seconds after he climbed over the fence when I heard a thump and a surprised groan. Then a stern, hold it right there, followed by another hard thump and a groan. Then the unmistakable sound of steel puncturing flesh and another hard thud. Charles leaned over the fence so I could see his dog grin. It's all good, he said. Sweet, should I come up? Yeah, and be quick about it, too. So up I went. Charles was already tossing one down the hill when I reached the fence. I didn't watch the body roll down, but I knew it made it to the bottom when I heard a crash in the bushes. Their big white van sat behind the truck. No license plates. I took a look inside through the front window. Nothing special to see. Hey, look at this. Charles hoisted up the other suit's limp body. His head slumped and his black fedora fell off, along with his slick back hair, apparently attached to the fedora. His head was bald and shiny, perfectly round, not bearing the slightest hint of evidence that hair had ever existed on it. Well, shit, said Charles. Wasn't expecting that. I said, bro, don't just be standing out in the middle of the road. Somebody's gonna see you. Charles looked at the road, which was empty just for the moment, and shrugged. They can come get some if they want, he said. Anyways, this is what I wanted to show you. 
With one hand, he lifted up the suit's head. The sunglasses must have fallen off in the struggle, because now I could see the eyes. I had to take a step closer just to confirm that what I was seeing was actually real. At first I was hesitant, but I came closer when I realized the static wasn't working anymore. Whatever Charles was holding up for me to see was clearly not a human being. The eyes, like that of Charles, were blue, but the difference between them was that even though Charles' eyes weren't always fully human, at least they always reminded me of an animal I could recognize. Even Darcy's eyes, as obviously evil as they were, at least they communicated the presence of a spirit I could somewhat understand, something within the earthly animal kingdom, even if they were tainted with something sinister underneath. These eyes, though, my brain couldn't configure at all. They say the eyes are the windows to the soul, but I think in order to build those windows, you need to at least throw some pupils on there. The thing's eyes were almost completely just its blue iris, with just a tiny border of white around them. These weren't real eyes, my brain told me, just a cheap knockoff version made by the hand of somebody who definitely wasn't the Great Spirit, and they were very, very bad. Well, I'll be damned, I said, squinting and staring. I didn't like looking at them, but I couldn't look away. And check this out, said Charles. He let go of the suit's head, reaching down to take the knife from his other hand. I moved back so as not to be in the line of fire when he slit the suit's throat. As soon as the flesh was cut, out gushed a waterfall of dark green ooze that spilled at my feet. I shook my head. Jesus H. Christ, I muttered. What the hell is this thing? I don't know, said Charles, but it wasn't too hard to drop him. When I was done gawking, I left Charles to toss the body over the fence to go be with its brother. Having taken the keys to the van out of one of their pockets, Charles opened up the back doors to the van. It was empty. We looked in the front seat. Nothing there either. The entire vehicle was completely empty. There weren't even registration documents. We searched around for a camera. There weren't any. Good. Charles started up the engine, and we saw that the gas tank was full. It should be able to make the trip, we figured. Charles poured the water into his coolant tank. Cue cigarette time. Looks like you've got yourself a car, said Charles. But what about the licensing and all that, I asked. Charles took a drag for effect and said, What about it? Well, I mean, I'm down to keep the van and everything, but somebody's got to own it, right? I can't go to prison, man. I'll be the town whore whether I like it or not, no question about it. We'll take care of it when we get there, said Charles. Don't trip. Take care of it how? Charles flicked his cigarette and flashed me the dog smile. Lost paperwork. I'm confused. What do you mean lost paperwork? Don't worry about it, said Charles. Let's head out. And so we headed out. To this day, I still have no idea what he meant by lost paperwork. Chapter 16 Charles flicked on his turn signal, breaking his streak of smooth, straight driving as we passed through the next town. I followed him into a gas station parking lot, hovering next to him where he stopped by a pump. Hey man, I'm gonna get some gas before we head out of this town, he called. You need anything? Uh, one second, let me check, I replied. I put the van in park and dug into my pocket for my pack of spirits. I opened the lid, looked inside, and said, Actually, you know what? I'm down to one stoke. You got enough to refill? Yeah, it should be good. Alright, cool. I'll just park up there and wait for you. So, I pulled up to the front door parking lot. Charles walked into the door, giving me a salute as he passed me by, which I returned. I could already tell it was going to take a minute. Not only was the parking lot packed and buzzing, but I could also see a sizable line at the register through the window. Time to make use of that last spirit. I got out of the van and went to the ashtray for cigarette time. There weren't any tweakers around, something I'd come to deeply appreciate at this point. The weather was nice this afternoon, so I stayed waiting outside after my cigarette was done. I waited and waited until I was rocking back and forth. With no phone, I couldn't see how much time had passed, so it was hard to tell if Charles was really taking a long time or if I was just being impatient. What I did know is that people were coming in and out with full shopping bags, and Charles still hadn't made it out with a pack of smokes. It's all good, I told myself. He's probably just taking a shit. I decided to kill some time by taking a lap or two around the store. I figured it best to get some of the wiggles out before I had to start driving again. Hands in my pockets, I crossed the front of the store to the other side. The wooden fence next to it created a sort of little alleyway. I turned the corner and... BOO! My entire cardiovascular system exploded all at once when Darcy jumped out at me. I screamed, WHAT THE FUCK! as a knee-jerk reaction, and my body jumped into fighting stance on instinct. 
I'm not sure what I would have done if I wasn't stopped cold by the next thing she said to me. I'd just keep it in my pants if I was you, Jimbo. These words were spoken through teeth that were either longer than before or just more exposed by shriveling gums. She was taller than before as well, nearly enough to look at me in the eyes from straight across. I made sure to stand at the edge of the corner where everyone could still see me. With no weapon on my person, this was the only defense I could think of, but I also knew it wasn't foolproof. She obviously didn't care to hide from the witnesses when she took a chunk out of poor old Joseph. What the fuck do you want? I whispered. What do I want? She began to raise her hands, which had grown to a disproportionate size. What do I want? I tell you what I want, sweetie. She moved her fingers in spidery motions, fingers bearing nails so long and thick that I couldn't even compare them to an animal anymore. If they were claws before, now they were little steak knives, still black as the grime on her hands. I want you to help me find my son, she said. I haven't been able to find him for a long time. She was making one of her sad faces now, but it wasn't very convincing with their eyes fixed in their angry state. Jesus H. Christ, when the fuck was Charles going to be done in there? I decided to play along and stall her until Charles came out and saw us. Where'd you see him last? I asked. Oh, I don't know, she said, putting her hand over her head in a deep thinking pose, arms now protruding far out of her jacket sleeves. I think I saw him with my younger son, or it might have been my oldest daughter. You have a lot of kids then? Oh, yeah. I got a son who's 24, a son who's 20, a daughter who's 18, a daughter who's 14, and... Oh, sweet Jesus! Darcy doubled over to nurse her feet, which had just been struck with a wave of red-hot fire burning, or so she described it as. As she knelt down and arched her back to nurse her still sort of bandaged feet, I could see the shape of her spine bulging under her clothes. I glanced at the front door. Plenty of folks were passing through, but still no Charles. I looked behind me. He wasn't at the pump yet, either. Darcy stood up again. Oh, my lucky stars, she said. It just keeps on getting worser and worser. I just try to use my Cherokee magic, but... She trailed off, shaking her head and panting. I kept on trying to make small talk. So, your son, I said. Where'd you say he was again? Well, I don't know, she cried. I know he was working for that one guy at that one place, but that was after he was at the other place, and I'm pretty sure he ended up working for that other guy at that other place after that. Sounds like quite the predicament. I know, it's just plain terrible, isn't it, though? I haven't seen any of my kids for at least four years. Why's that? Well, I can't find him, stupid. You know this. I crossed my arms. I had no idea, I argued. At least not till you told me. Yes, you did, said Darcy. You know it very well. Everyone knows it nowadays. Well, if you say so. Of course I say so, said Darcy, getting a little agitated now. I wouldn't be saying it if it wasn't the God's honest truth, now would I? I glanced at the door again. Come on, Charles. I looked back to Darcy. She was scowling now, looking more rotted and ghoulish than ever before. As malnourished and tight and sunken in as all her facial features were now, I'd have never guessed that it was really her if I didn't know better, and not some twisted costume for a B-list horror movie production. I stood there with my arms still crossed, watching her without speaking, waiting for her to start up another rant. She stared right back, also silent, save for her slow, heavy breathing. Her eyes twitched every now and then, but never at the same time. Her mouth hung open, and after a few long moments had passed, a line of dribble crept its way out and over her bottom lip. I wondered, but dared not ask, why she hadn't decided to attack me yet. Obviously, she was able to somehow follow us everywhere. She'd managed to take me by surprise every time now, and she obviously had some kind of motive for it all. Charles had knocked her out and we'd both run off with her money. I'd stabbed her in the gun, which she seemed to have fully recovered from, and with all the other rips and holes in her clothes, it was hard to tell where the wound was. So why hadn't she exacted her vengeance yet? The door opened again. I glanced over, and praise be it was good old Charles at long last. I immediately called his name and rushed over. What is it? he asked, and I turned to point at Darcy. That way he could get rid of her, or help me talk to her, figure out what the fuck the deal was, or for crying out loud, something. But of course, when I turned back to point, Darcy was gone. Charles stopped and asked, What's going on, man? I pointed again at the void where she had been, as if there was still something there to see. You didn't smell her? I asked. Smell what? Darcy! She was just here, like literally one second ago. Charles sniffed the air and looked puzzled. No, he said. I didn't smell her. Actually, he thought for a moment. Yeah, no, I don't think I ever did smell her. Charles, do you have any idea what the fuck is going on right now? With her? No, I don't. 
What I do know, though, is that I didn't have a whole lot of money left, so all I got was one pack of some cheap-ass cigarettes that we're gonna have to split them. With that, Charles filled up his tank, and we took a moment to open the pack. Don't trip, we're almost there, he said. I took a bundle of cigarettes from his hand. How'd you know I was tripping? You're always tripping. I stuffed the cigarettes in my empty spirit box. Yeah, I said. You got me there for damn sure. It's gonna be all good, said Charles. We'll ask Gramps when we get there, and I'm sure he'll know about it. Is that what you call him? Charles flashed the dog smile. Sometimes. Sometimes.